Hello, and welcome to the Chiaroscuro Jazz Podcasts. I'm George Graham, Director of Artistry and Repertoire for the Venerable Jazz Label, celebrating our 50th anniversary and featuring over 100 titles by some of the world's great jazz musicians. This time we feature drummer extraordinaire Louis Belson, who had a lengthy career and was an associate of many of the jazz greats, including Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Harry James, Duke Ellington, and Count Basie. He was also a prolific composer and arranger and is probably known to many rock fans as being the first drummer to use two bass drums. He was also well known to many students over the years for his drum and band clinics in high schools and colleges. He led his own big band for a while and recorded prolifically with nearly a hundred releases under his own name from 1952 to 1998. He recorded one album for Chiaroscuro called Salute with a great jazz quintet featuring trumpeter Bobby Shue, saxophonist George Young, pianist Willie Pickens and bass player Keeter Betts. The album was recorded on one of the numerous jazz cruises that Chiaroscuro founder Hank O'Neill helped to produce. From that album, here's Blowin' the Blues Away, a composition by Horace Silver, the Louis Belson Quintet.
the Louis Belson Quintet doing the Horace Silver composition Blowin' the Blues Away from the Chiaroscuro double album Salute. Born Luigi Paulino Alfredo Francesco Antonio Balassoni in 1924, drummer Louis Belson got an early start with some big names in jazz. One of the distinctive features of many of Chiaroscuro's CDs is the Jazz Speak track, with the artists speaking about their music in their own words. Here's Louis Belson. When I was 17 years old, I joined Benny Goodman's band. And it was a unique audition with Benny because I was on the road with Ted Fiorito. In fact, a lot of people say, well, how'd you join Ted Fiorito? I said, well, in those days, all the bands came to Davenport, Iowa, which is right across the river from Moline. And they'd all say, get Lou to sit in and play drums. So I'd sit in with this band or that band. So when I sat in with Ted Fiorito, he said, you got the job. He said, my drummer's leaving. Frank Flynn was his name. He said, you got the job right now if you want it. I said, no, I got three months of high school, but if you want me to join the band then, I'll do it. He said, okay, that's a deal. Kept his word, and my first gig was to fly out to California, play at the Florentine Gardens, a big place on Hollywood Boulevard, and the Mills Brothers were the main attraction. And I had to play a big show. Of course, I could sight read like crazy, playing timpani. I did all that, so I was ready for that. And during that three months at that club, Freddie Goodman, Benny Goodman's brother, came in, and heard me play, sent a note up to the bandstand. I came over to the table. He said, my name is Freddie Goodman. I'm Benny Goodman's brother. He said, how would you like to audition with Benny Goodman? I started stuttering all over the place. I said, well, I don't know what to tell you because I just left home three months ago, and Ted Fiorito was very nice to me. He said, well, why don't you come down anyway? Just play with Benny. You like to play with Benny, don't you? I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I went down to Paramount Studios the next day, and with no audition. I heard Benny say, where's that kid? Where's the drummer? And Freddie introduced me to him, and he said, okay, put the tuxedo on him, tell him to go in the makeup, and we're on the set. So he didn't hear me play anything. Got on the set, said, okay, let's play. Well, I forget what the tune was. I think something like Sweet Georgia Brown or something like that with a small group. I played the number. They filmed it. And after that, Benny said, okay, we leave Thursday night on the train. So I thought to myself, what am I going to tell Ted? And all the guys in the band said, you go, and we'll tell him. Don't worry about it. So I left. And with Benny, it was very unique because he was a real-time bug. With the other leaders, like Basie and Ellington, they were piano players, rhythm section players. So we had a chance to play with the rhythm section before the band came in. So there was never a problem where the groove was because the band had a whole one or two courses to hear the groove before the ba da bum bam bam right in. But a stand-up leader, he had to give you one, two, one, two, three, four. Sometimes that's too mechanical. You can't really get it. It takes about eight or 12 bars to get in what he really meant. But Benny would take his time so you'd make sure to to get what his tempo was because he was a master with tempos. He was very well aware of everything a drummer did. And you learned an awful lot by working with that band. Rehearsal time came. He would rehearse just the saxophones alone, then the brass alone, then the brass and saxophones without the rhythm section because he felt you can have the greatest rhythm section in the world but this side of the band's got to play on time, too. He wasn't too interested in, if I wrote something, somebody said, yeah, he writes arrangements, too. He wasn't too interested in that because he had Fletcher Henderson things, and who's going to compare with that? So when I joined Dorsey's band, he was the first guy that said, okay, we need a drum number. I heard you do some writing. Why don't you get together with Sid Cooper, the lead alto player, and come up with something? So Sid and I wrote a thing called Drumology, and he recorded it. That's the first time that... Any band leader, away from the drums, said, you do something for the band, and we'll play it. With Harry James, it was beautiful. He just wanted me to write all over the place. In fact, the Hawk Talks, which I brought on Duke's band, which was quite a big hit, was written for Harry James. His name was also referred to as the Hawk, not only Coleman Hawkson, but Harry James. So when I left Harry to join Duke's band, he said, take this arrangement with you. It took me a while to bring the charts in for Ellington because... I thought, no, I'm not going to bring any music in, not with Strayhorn and him around. So he had to ask me about three or four times. He says, come on, bring that stuff in. So Wayne Teasall said, look, get the music and bring it in. The most he can say is, all right, sounds good, and put it away. But he recorded both of them right away. So that was an honor for me, I mean, for Ellington to record even a couple of my things. So they allowed me to become some sort of an arranger as well as a drummer. But I started first with the Dorsey Band. With Basie, I did the same thing. I brought some charts in for Basie. One thing they recorded 
was put it right here. It's sort of like a typical girl talk thing that Neil Hefty would write. And he recorded it right away. I was very fortunate to have that kind of uh, association with all these guys. It would have been nice enough just to be able to play drums with them without having all this other icing on the cake. But the difference in the bands, with Ellington, you played a lot of different things. You could look at the itinerary and say, okay, Grace Cathedral, San Francisco. New music. You're playing in the back of a dancer, playing with a choir, playing music that's not straight ahead like Basie's band. You're playing with a symphony jazz band. Then on the itinerary, here we come with the band playing with Toscanini's NBC Orchestra. You always had elements of surprise with Duke. And you got into more of the things like suites and three movements, like the Harlem Suite, the Liberian Suite, volumes of music that you played. It wasn't just like tune after tune like Basie did. That was a difference musically. Basie used to say there was nobody like Duke because first of all, he had all the soloists and the stuff that they wrote, him and Strayhorn. It was so musical, so much music. Well, one of the great things about Basie and Ellington, from my side of the scene, being a drummer, being a rhythm section player, is that they were rhythm section players. And they were both great dynamic piano players. Both of them knew exactly where the tempo should be. And by the time they played two and three courses, the band was at ease. They knew exactly where the groove was for that certain tune. And there was no doubt as to where the time was. Louis Belson from his Jazz Speak segment on the Chiaroscuro album, Salute. Now here's the Louis Belson quintet with the Disney tune, When You Wish Upon a Star, featuring trumpeter Bobby Shue. Thank you. 
the Louis Belson Quintet with When You Wish Upon a Star from the Chiaroscuro album Salute, featuring Bobby Shu on trumpet, George Young on sax, Willie Pickens on piano, Keeter Betts on bass, and Louis Belson on the drums, recorded in 1994. Now here's more from Louis Belson from his jazz speak on passing on the jazz traditions. I always get the question, why do you do so many clinics? And the reason for that is Joe Jones, Big Sid Catlett, and players like that, Cozy and Gene, they showed me a lot of things, and they said, don't ever let that slip by. Show some youngsters. Don't hesitate. Don't let this great heritage drop. Pass it on. Somebody showed us. We show you. You show somebody else. So I always impress upon the youngsters, you have to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. Know about Chick Webb. Know about Zooty Singleton, Gene, Buddy, all these guys, and then bring it up to date. I just didn't stop because I come from that era. I kept on listening to Steve Gadd, Billy Cobham, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams, and even newer guys now, Dave Weckl, Gary Novak, Marvin Smitty Smith, and some of the rock drummers who were really basically great players. Greg Bissonette is one. Dennis Chambers is another one. Vinny Calayuda is another one. I've always kept my eyes and ears open. I think it's very important because I'm not a rock and roll player, but I can play rock and roll. That's why I always tell the youngsters, I can play your style of music, but you can't play mine. Once you pay your dues, then you'll be able to do both. But I always wanted to be interested to find out what was on the scene. I wanted to be another Steve Gadd, in other words, because Steve studied the instrument. He studied with John Beck, Eastman School of Music. He knows the drum set. You can put him in a swing band, he'll shine. You can put him in a funk band, he'll shine. You give him something difficult to read, he'll shine. He knows how to play for singers, he shines. And that's what I always want to do, be complete. I always keep my eyes and ears. When somebody says to me, will you hear this guy play? I say, okay, all right, go check him out. And you learn something. I respect a lot of young players today. The only thing that bothers me is it's too bad the way the drummers are brought up today. They don't get that intermediate training like we had. They have to go from school right into a concert hall where when I grew up, we had to pay our dues on the road. We learned how to play in theaters where a drummer had to learn how to play for a dance act and jugglers and singers. When you played in the vaudeville theater, you learn how to be an MC, you learn how to sing, you learn how to dance, you learn how to do everything. You can say to Clark Terry, do a time step, do the shim sham shimmy, or sing, or be an MC. Everybody, Dizzy could do it, Joe Jones could do it, Big Sid, that's what you did. And the ballrooms were all open. Some of the drummers today, they miss that, that excitement of that intermediate training that you get before you jump from this point to this point. Boy, if I hadn't played all those theaters, had a chance to play with all those tap dancers and played for a lot of singers, that's a big void. When Clark Terry and I do a lot of clinics together, I notice that the youngsters want to talk about our experiences with the bands. What happened in the theater? What happened in the ballroom? They missed that era. There's a lot of exciting things happening today. There's no question about it. But that was a golden era with songwriters, comedians, musicians. It's hard for any jazz band to play a whole set or make a record without something of Ellington or something Cole Porter or something of Gershwin. I'm talking about the real bands. It's still alive. Louis Belson from his Jazz Speak track on his album Salute. Now here's more music from the album with an original by trumpet player Bobby Shue called Counting Down.
the Louis Belson Quintet from the Chiaroscuro album Salute, featuring Bobby Shu, the piece's composer, on trumpet, George Young on sax, Willie Peckins on piano, Keeter Betts on bass, and Louis Belson on the drums. The album was recorded in 1994 on a cruise in the Caribbean and produced by Andrew Sordoni. Louis Belson passed away in 2009 at the age of 84 after a long and productive career. You can find Louis Belson's tribute, along with many other Chiaroscuro releases, on our website at chiaroscurojazz.org, where you can find a searchable database of the artists and music on the label. The music is available on CD, as a download, and streaming on Spotify, Amazon, and Apple Music, along with other streaming services. And you can also listen to continuous jazz from the over 100 albums available on Chiaroscuro 24 hours a day on the Chiaroscuro channel, available on our website. This is George Graham. Thanks for listening to this Chiaroscuro podcast, and join us next time for more music from great jazz artists.